Hello everyone and welcome to this seminar today. I hope you're all enjoying the fair and embracing this new virtual setting. So with me to discuss a career in technology today is Emma McConville, a marketing executive with First Derivatives and Ian Doyle, consulting manager from Guidewire. Hello to you both. Hello Pierce. Hi Pierce, thanks for having us. No problem at all. So as always, guys, for everyone watching, we encourage you to ask as many questions as possible by using the chat, fun chat function. And time permitting, I'll try and put as many as I can to both Ian and Emma at the end of the seminar. So Emma, we just kick off, start with yourself, please. Just kind of give a bit of background of how you got to your current role and what a kind of typical day looks like for you at the moment. Yeah, and um, thanks so much, Piers. So um, my name is Emma McConville and I'm a graduate recruitment and marketing executive at First Derivatives. Um, so I didn't come from the traditional technology background that um, you know Ian might have come from, um, for example. Um, I have a background in communication, advertising and marketing. Um, and I was really just able to show that I had the, the competencies and the skills that were transferable to the technology sector um, when I went for this job in recruitment. And now my day um, is very busy and it looks like um, recruiting graduates really from all over the world for roles like data science and um, software engineering and also finance um, and trading technology. And um, so we recruit from all around the world for the APAC region and um, US, Canada, um, as well as the UK and all of Ireland. Um, and then I also do some marketing to get our roles out there um, and things like this uh, today and lots of fairs and things. And um, so hope to get to speak to some of you um, over the course of the day. That's great. I mean, thanks. It sounds like you're very busy and, you know, it's great to get a different perspective. Well, I said you're in the marketing end, but you're working for, you know, a, a tech company ostensibly. So it's good to get, you know, that perspective as well. And Ian, can you just give us a bit of background about, you know, your role and kind of how you got to here today? Yeah. So um, as was discussed, I kind of came from a technical background, probably like a lot of people maybe on the call. I, I did a software development course in DIT, which has obviously now changed names and graduated in 2006, worked for IBM for a number of years and then went into a consulting role with Deloitte. Um, and then I joined Guidewire when it was a very small operation in Dublin. It was still a decent sized company, about 800 people, but it was a very small operation in Dublin. And I think I was about the 10th Dublin employee and we've since grown to around 400 people in our Dublin office. Um, so primarily my role now, I moved into a management role a number of years ago, is kind of people management. So I managed a team of about 20 people, as well as handling our kind of the graduate recruiting process um, for my team. Um, and that's worldwide. So we have five offices around the world in San Jose, in Philadelphia, in Dublin, which is our largest, in Madrid and in Kuala Lumpur as well. So making sure there's a unified process for recruiting across those different regions. And then also running um, the intern recruitment and internship program as well. So we're looking for seven interns this year and um, probably going to start to recruit on that next month and then joining us in February. And we do a, a six month rotation on the internship program. That's great. It's fantastic to hear from two people who are you know directly involved in the graduate recruitment end of the business as well, which is I think it's like fair point to hear. So Ian, if we just uh, stick with you on the first question, which is I want to talk a little bit about the kind of main roles that are available for students and graduates in technology today. You know, I think people kind of know the main ones. And but if you can go to them and if there have any been any new ones created, you know, maybe due to COVID or even in just the last year or two, and how they've come about as well. Yeah, like I suppose it's 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 kind of got away, I think, from defined roles that you you, you might go in as a software developer, as a QA engineer, as whatever. Um, and really, I think for me, it's where getting this mindset of continual learning and development. And ultimately, like you might have six, seven, eight careers in your one career. You know, like, you know, I, I started in a technical role. I was, you know, very much a software developer. That's what I saw myself as. I then moved into a consultancy role, which I was still very technical. But obviously that communication and advocacy piece and advisory piece was very strong. I kind of learned those skills. I then moved into a management role where you're kind of very much thinking about strategic management and kind of leadership and things like that and mentoring and what it is to be a mentor. And I, I don't know, a couple of years from now, I might have a different role. And even if you stay on the technical path, you can kind of start as a software developer, move into an architecture role, move into different roles of data science and things like that. So I suppose it's it's for people to see themselves as, as resilient and um, as open to change and see those opportunities and to really to see the core skills you have as not as the knowledge, but the ability to learn. And um, so really core building blocks on which you can kind of base a really solid career, no matter where that career goes for. So certainly there's going to be jobs in five years that we have no concept of what they might be right now. Similar to five years ago, there was jobs, you know, that we had no concept of. And again, a lot of traditional skills will probably come outdated. So it's making sure you're constantly up to date. And um, so I suppose when we hire in people, we very much hire in 
for that promise of the future then. So like, you know, we certainly hire him with a base level of knowledge, but we fully expect to have to train them loads, to have to mentor them a lot. But we're hiring them for the seven or 10 years or however long we get out of them, hopefully a long time, of the potential that they're going to show to us over that time, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think now it's more about, you know, the kind of personality you have and the values that you have as a person rather than your kind of core technical skills. If that makes sense? Because as you say, you'll teach everyone what they need to know when you get there, but it's about matching, you know, Guidewire or First Derivatives values and, you know, what you want from them as a person and, and they you want from you as a company as well. Again, and the passion they show. So like, are they genuinely interested? What drives them? What motivates them? Because like in a large company like myself and the First Derivatives, like Guidewire and First Derivatives, there's going to be loads of different roles and loads of opportunities. So it's not like we're typecast that this one person can do this one job it's about well how can we make a really successful team and that might be pulling in people together with different strengths and different abilities and different gaps and teaching each other and helping each other and this is something that we're very focused on brilliant and you know i think you mentioned there as well in the core skills people need and that's something we'll touch on you know later on as well the most transferable skills and from your point of view can you talk a little bit uh, about you know the kind of roles the first derivatives would hire for and that you're involved in recruiting with but also then maybe give it a bit Talk about, about what it's like marketing for one of these companies. So like I said, you don't have the tech role, but you have a role within a tech company, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I'll start off just um, with the first part of that question. So some real growth areas that we're seeing at the moment um, is definitely cloud computing skills. And um, so there's lots of opportunities in the cloud space um, at the moment, um, both for third party companies like First Derivatives and then also directly with those cloud providers. So the likes of AWS um, and Azure. Um, and Google Cloud, for example, um, we recently launched, um, you know, we've invested heavily in our partnerships um, with those guys and we launched a certification program to try and get every consultant in our company certified um, on Amazon Web Services. So um, there's just a real demand um, in that area we have found at the moment um, to get our clients migrated over to the cloud. So anybody with those um, skills are highly desirable to us. Um, and then also data science is a huge um, growth area for us as well. Um, so originally all of our opportunities in data science would have been um, based around um, the finance industry, which is kind of our um, where we began um, because you know it's, its main um, suitability was for you know the stock market um, and high volume you know data analytics and um, super fast and um, data analytics was really um, the thing that was important um, for that industry. but now you know, Almost every sector companies are um, accumulating more data than they know what to do with. And that's creating um, huge jobs opportunities in the data science field. Um, so even companies, you know, we have a client, Aston Martin and um, Red Bull Racing, um, and we have jobs in that, um, that area for uh, wind tunnel analysis. And um, so it's really transferable now, um, the, this type of software, the, the high volume data data analytics and um, software. So it can be used in finance, it can be used in automotive manufacturing, marketing, and you name it. So there's tons of opportunities there. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Sorry, Piers. No worries, Emma. So just from your point of view, I think it's interesting to hear from someone who works in a company that's heavily involved with tech, but your role isn't, you know, so much tech related. Mm -hmm. So how do you find, you know, fitting in given that your background isn't in technology? Yes, um, so obviously, you know, a bit of a shock to the system and um, first coming in, there's a lot uh, to take in, but you just have to be really adaptable and open-minded and be willing to learn, but you need to have that real interest there um, and that, that drive and that want to understand um, what people do. Um, I'm advertising jobs and first derivatives, you know, that's a huge part of my role on social media. So I need to understand, uh, you know, what are these people doing? What are the type of um, skills, core skills that you mentioned, Ian? Um, that we're looking for, you know, what type of people are really going to um, fit into these roles. And that's something that I've become um, very interested in and very good at seeing in graduates. And um, so I know we're going to touch on um, some of those skills later on, but um, it's something that I've become very familiar with. Um, but yes, it was quite scary to come into and, and a little bit overwhelming at the start, but um, I think anybody can do it really if they put their mind to it. Yeah, really, really, really good answer there, Emma. Like, you know, you don't want it to be an intimidating sector. And it's good to see that, you know, there are roles there for people who might want to work for a tech company, but don't have that technical background. You know, there are still roles then them to go into. You touched on the cloud computing there, Emma, in terms of, you know, a good transferable skill to have. So, Ian, just throw this uh, over your way. Aside from maybe the cloud computing, what would you see as some of the kind of main transferable skills students graduate would need to have in the tech sector? So even if they are moving around a lot, and as you say, you could have six or seven careers within the one, you know, what are the main transferable skills they need to have? 
Um, certainly problem solving probably first up there, both abstract and concrete problem solving. So problem solving in the sense that you're strategic and seeing, you know, how a process can be improved maybe if you go into a project, if you can see improvements from previous projects you were on, as well as just that core problem solving ability, like when given a, a technical problem, how do I solve it and solve it effectively? Um, and that's pretty much language agnostic. So like, you know, we pretty much would develop an awful lot in Java and core OOP technologies, but really we are happy to look at people from different backgrounds whose maybe primary skill is in different languages, as long as they can show us that they can transfer that knowledge. Because ultimately, again, language-wise and technology-wise, you know, AWS certainly is, is an area for development for us as well. But, you know, if someone's coming in with Azure or um, things like that, like again, the skills are very, very transferable there. So it's that really core building block of knowledge from a gradual point of view that we look for. Um, so like I said, problem solving skills, communication skills, team working skills, um, and just a really positive attitude as well, I suppose is very important. So someone's gonna come in and be passionate about learning and be enthusiastic about that um, and be open to kind of what we want to teach them, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I'm not even gonna you know, pretend to understand what half of that meant in terms of the code language and everything. <laughs> I, I'm hoping some people on the call do. So like, you look, calling out of the questions, if I'm wrong about anything, I'm in a couple of years away from a hardcore tech role. So I, I might've lost my touch a little bit. Oh, no, um, just from my point of view, it all sounded very good and proper. So that's the main thing. Uh, Emma, from your side, is there anything, you know, transferable skills, Ian hasn't mentioned there, even not from a core tech background. So like I said, Ian talked about the code there, but you know, I said you're an American role. What kind of skills, transferable skills do you think are important? Yeah. Um, so one of the main skills, obviously, problem solving is, you know, the, the standard one, the, the really important one that's needed for any tech role. Um, but also, I think time management is so important. Um, no matter what um, technical role you're going to in go into, you're going to have to prioritize your tasks, you know, what's important and also deliver um, for your team, um, especially if your role um, dictates someone else's role. And um, so you delivering on time on your, um, you know, aspect of that project is going to affect them. And um, so I think that's really important um, time management skills and um, particularly at the moment um, with so many of us working remotely. You're not always going to have someone standing over your shoulder telling you, you know, you need to get this done now or, you know, this is a priority. So you need to know how to manage your own time. So I think that's really transferable to this sector. Excellent. And just to stick with you, Emma, I think, you know, we mentioned a few soft skills there. And I think a lot of people associate, you know, the technology industry and sector with mainly kind of hard skills, you know, again, to have the coding and things like that. But how important are people skills and, you know, being able to, deal with people on a daily basis and communication skills in general in the technology sector? Yeah, um, I think people skills are totally important in the technology sector. Um, no matter, you know, how, um, you know, far in a dark room you are um, in your role, um, you're always going to report into someone, you're always going to be working alongside someone else, you know, be that in a team environment or even just reporting directly to a manager. Um, you need to be able to, you know, get your point across, you know, what are your ideas? What are you working on at the moment and what problems are you facing? You know, these are the things that you need to be able to communicate well. And um, as I said earlier, with so many of us working remotely as well, you need to be able to get that message across um, really clearly. And um, so I think that's so important. And then also, you know, a lot of, you know, roles in the tech sector, you're going to end up needing to communicate with someone who is um, like myself or yourself here, so who's not so technical. And so being able to cut through the jargon, um, I think is so important and be able to communicate um, to less technical people. You know, it's, you might not be working directly with a client, but even, you know, if you're in an IT support role and you're working with someone um, in a company and telling them how to fix something on their computer, you know, you need to be able to cut through the jargon and communicate with them in language that they're able to understand. So I think um, people skills are really important. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, sorry, you're going. Just completely agree with that. I think, you know, it can be overlooked and I think it's it's quickly becoming, you know, as important as technical skills, if not as important as technical skills right now for us. So we have had situations where we've had people come in and interview with us and they've been technically like amazing, just absolutely blown us out of the water. But we fundamentally feel that there may be their team working skills or their motivation or passion for working in a team isn't there. And these are the roles we have. And on the other hand, we've also seen people come in whose technical skills haven't necessarily been lacking, but haven't been as strong as others. But we see something in them in that, you know, that potential in terms of their communication skills of the ability to advocate, the ability to communicate effectively um, with non-technical people. Um, and we see huge promise there. We've also hired those people. So we have had said no to people who technically it's a slam dunk for us, but we feel just on that communication side isn't there. And I think that role of, of sitting in a dark room with headphones on, like 
hard, heavy metal music blaring. I, I don't think that exists anymore. I, I really hope it doesn't. Um, but certainly I think it's all about teamwork now. It's all about, you know, what you can add to a team. And it's not to say that everyone has to be the same, but you are going to be expected to contribute to your team. Everyone, you know, a lot of the software development companies now work in a very agile framework as well. So again, that puts a huge emphasis on communication. Um, so communication is really a cornerstone of what we interview for and also what we train practice up on as part of our graduate program. It's a real cornerstone of that in terms of consultancy skills, time management, advocacy skills, negotiation, public speaking, things like this. Yeah, I think sometimes when people say communication, it can kind of get lost in what it actually means, but because there's so many facets to it and it's like, you know, it can get lost very easily. Like you said, Emma, being able to explain, you might have all the knowledge in the world, but it's being able to explain something really complicated in the simplest terms possible is really, really important. And then, you know, even within, within your team or, you know, to your line manager or your seniors, explain that you don't know how to do something or articulating that, articulating that in a way that I don't know, but I want to learn it as well, you know, can also be really important. Ian, if I just uh, stick with you on the next one as well, which is about you know, the graduate roles within Guidewire and the career path for them. Could you just talk a bit about what it looks like kind of when they first walk in and, you know, where they then go from there? Yeah, so I suppose they first walk in and it is the technical role we're looking for. So we're essentially looking for technical consultants or software development consultants. So it's a mix of a kind of a consultancy role and a technical role. So primarily it's software development. So being able to come in and solve complex technical problems. So um, what Guidewire does is provide solutions to insurance companies around the world. So some of the largest insurance companies. So you could well be working on a system that's going to have five, 10, 15 billion dollars a year flowing through it. So really top end of kind of that complexity of the financial services market. And um, so we need people who can kind of handle that complexity, like in, in building blocks in small ways, but build up to it. In terms of the career path, I suppose um, a lot of people stick on that technical career path. If you've joined you know, a technical course, and if you're a software developer, you probably want to stick to that. Again, that can go lots of different ways. You can go up and become a team lead. So kind of, you know, actually lead a team. And again, your, your technical skills have to be very strong there, but also you have to advocate for that team and communicate well with them. And um, you can become a kind of a, a project manager, possibly. So we have kind of some more non-technical roles that some technical people go into. There's other, other roles within the company and other departments that people can move into over time. And we have had people do this. So we have some field consulting roles as well. So we have had people who've moved into um, kind of our services center in Dublin and over time maybe migrated into a similar role, but a traveling role. So maybe on site with a customer as opposed to being fully remote. And then we also have kind of management and strategic leadership roles as well for people. And also to say that, you know, I think when we when I started, there was kind of a career path, which was technical. And now there's probably about six career paths. I fully expect a couple of years from now, there'll be new career paths. So one of the areas that we probably are going to start looking at over the next couple of years is kind of more business focused courses. And um, so for business analysts and things like that um, and kind of other related to technology, but not hardcore tech. Uh, roles as well so what I would say is I think every company is kind of you know expanding the remit of roles they have and not necessarily looking at maybe the narrow focus of a person who comes in but like you know can this person who come in just be valuable to us we don't quite know where that value will be in the future but we see value in this person and I think it was referenced a bit earlier and um, by you were saying that you know first derivatives have kind of expanded what actually it does maybe from five ten years ago to what it does now yeah, and I think with, you know, uh, graduate careers as well, sorry to come across you there, but just to say that I think a lot of people, they want to drive their own careers now. So there might be a set path that they want to follow, but if they find out that there's something else that they're actually really good at or they show aptitude and something else, you know, the path can go down a completely different way as well. And this is like, this is ultimately my day-to-day -day role in Guidewire. I'm a people manager, but I suppose we kind of have this phrase that we're career coaches that really, I, I manage people in the sense that like there's a lot of the nuts and bolts of proving holidays that's not the job because that's there's no real massive skill in that but I suppose the mentoring and actually saying to someone what do you want to do with your, with your career so really getting to the heart of what what motivates you what do you get excited about what makes you want to go into work on a Monday morning back when you could all actually go to a workplace but you know what are these kind of things that really drive you and then let's find what that is either in your current role or possibly in a different team or if there's an opportunity in the future it's my job to kind of really push them towards that and make that apparent for them um, and I think an awful lot of companies are looking at that are very, very people focused as opposed to role focused and saying, well, you are a person with these great skills. Maybe you have phenomenal resilience. Let's just put you into a bit of a role with a tons of churn. And you actually thrive in that in a way that someone else may not. And let's not put them into that role, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. Like some of perfectly John there can't really add into that. Emma, do you want to kind of give a bit of background as well to you know, what I graduate career with, you know, Fidelity Investments look like, as you said, there's a number of roles there, but even kind of a generic kind of path that someone might have to follow. 
Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have a very similar experience to Ian. You know, people come in and say, you know, what is the, the career path here? Where am I going to be? And unfortunately, the answer is, you know, you could be anywhere and it's totally up to you. And so what I do kind of want to add is just to give a bit of advice on how to go about that. And what I would say is, you know, what you're going to want might change. You know, look how many roles you've been you've been in, Ian, for example. But just communicating with whoever you're reporting into all of the time and say, listen, I want a plan in place. Here's where I want to get to and how am I going to get there? So if you want to become more technical, you know, you might need to take some certifications, for example. That's some things that we offer in First Derivatives. We offer Java and C Sharp um, certifications, you know, just so you can have that on your CV and to help you progress and take on more technical um, roles. But if you want to go down a different route, you know, you need to communicate that um, to whoever is in charge of, of getting you onto those roles and you can really transition into to anything. Um, if you, you know, speak up and say, you know, this is where I want to be and use people like Ian and mentors and people who've been there and, and bought the t-shirt and know, you know, what's, what's the thing to do in this situation to get me where I want to go. Yeah, exactly. I think it's important to say that they echo the point there about, you know, use people who are senior to, you know, most people are very happy to lend their experience to people and, you know, and it makes, you know, their job easier as well in the future if you can do your job properly. So people are very, very happy to help out no matter how senior they are. Uh, very conscious that we have just about under 10 minutes left and we've loads of really good questions coming in. So if you do want them answered, keep, keep them coming in. So just one thing I really did want to touch on that I think was important is, you know, the gender balance within the tech industry. And I mean, we just stick with you. You know, I think lately, and in most other sectors, the gender balance is improving, you know, for the better. But from your end, have you seen that in the technology sector and even maybe in the marketing role that you're in as well? Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. I've definitely seen an improvement in um, the gender balance because a lot of tech companies are now really, you know, putting plans in place and getting into action with actively seeking um, women to come on board. Um, for example, we are very lucky in First Derivatives that we do have a lot of females in senior management positions and that automatically makes our company accessible um, to women, um, whereas that's not the case in, in many other companies and they have to do a little bit more um, to get the word out there. Um, a lot of companies, I'm sure, and um, this is done with you guys as well, Ian, a lot of companies are now going into schools you know, and addressing um, young women at a very early age. Um, and, you know, cutting through the myths and the stereotypes of the, the man with the headset on in, in the dark room. And it just doesn't have to be that way. And um, you can use all of those fantastic skills that you have, you know, and being a people, per a people person and also, you know, interested in technology. And that can go a long way. And um, we certainly have a long way to go. But it's great to see there's a lot of initiatives um, coming up out there now. So, for example, in First Derivatives, we have a female mentorship program that we offer to um, young women who are of university age. Um, we just implemented that this year. And then we also have a women's network internally um, where people can um, get access to mentors you know, during their career while they're working for us. So things are definitely improving. That's great. I'm sure, uh, Ian, sorry, I'm sure you'd echo a lot of, you know, what Emma said that I know in the recent grad stories, video shoots, you know, guide wires, and then three, you know, uh, females entered the shoot, which is, you know, brilliant and great to see. And just from your perspective, you know, someone who's a bit maybe further down the career journey and has maybe seen it evolve a little bit more, what have your experiences been of the kind of gender balance and how it's changed over the recent years? Yeah, look, it's definitely moving in the right direction. I would, though, preface that with saying there's a ton of work to do. Um, and I think you could kind of look at this and say, well, you know, it's we only have certain responsibilities or opportunities as employers. But I think, you know, what was said earlier is very true. We should be going into schools. We should be actually as an industry looking at this as an industry wide problem, because if you look at the dropout rates of females in, you know, technical courses, it's higher than men. If you look actually at you know, the amount of women who kind of rise to senior positions and some of that is socioeconomic as well in terms of how women are treated within the workplace in general. Um, but I think there's huge things we can do as employers and we should always be very, very strong advocates for this. And I think things like internal mentoring networks, which we have in Guido ourselves and really strong representation on everything from, you know, class talks to events to anything at all to things like this, I think are really good. Um, that actually kind of show women that look, they, they can be in this position because I think an awful lot of them do get turned off by the stereotype of the role as opposed to the reality of the role. And, and certainly like in my experience, like some of the best managers I've ever had and some of the best people I've ever worked with, work with have been females. And I think they bring a unique aspect as well because of life experience to roles, which I think can't be underestimated. Um, but like I said, I think there's a ton of work to do. We're moving in the right direction, but I think we should also be held to account and hold each other to account to get much, much better. You know, no pats on the back for trying. We, when we get there, we can congratulate ourselves and say, well done, but 
there's a, a lot of work to do to get there, you know? No, 100%. I don't think there's much more I can say than that. It's, again, both of you summed up, summed up perfectly. So we've just about five minutes left. So I'm going to try and get to as many questions as I can. Apologies if I don't get your question, but I'll try to do as much, much of them as I can. So first question here is just saying that, you know, there are some graduate roles out there in the, in the technology sector that look for experience. And they just want to know how important is it to have, you know, tangible experience? You know, is it as important maybe as it was a few years ago? Um. I'd be surprised at a grad role that looked for experience, if I'm honest. That's not a grad role to me. Um, it's, it's an experienced role. I, a grad role, certainly, you know, something like an internship could be hugely positive. So if you have an opportunity to an internship, I would thoroughly recommend it. I know not every course does, but try your best, maybe even if it's on your own terms, to kind of try and get a summer internship and um, because it gives you that practical experience. But in my mind, the ethos of a grad program, graduate recruiting, should be to bring in people with potential and teach them it shouldn't be to look for that ability already inherent within them because that's not a graduate, that's an experienced hire. Um, and while they certainly are important in the industry, I think a graduate, I, I wouldn't expect a huge amount of any experience or real world experience, or I certainly wouldn't look to exclude people because they didn't have it. Yeah, it's good, good to hear that as well, that, you know, I think there is a perception of that out there that, oh, I need to have three years experience in this role. But as you said, Ian, it's a graduate role. You know, people yeah. don't, your experience is in college and university in your degree, you know, if, you've, if you're lucky enough to do an internship. But like I said, some courses don't offer that. So, but once you sow the initiative to, that, yeah. that you've done something as well. Yeah, absolutely. And like, look, it doesn't have to be internships. It can be, you know, stuff in your own time, GitHub repositories. It can be involved in open source projects and just be like a passion for reading about technology or learning about technology and coming in and spending half the interview talking about all this cool stuff you read about. Like, that's fantastic. Um, but again, kind of to show that interest level and there's ways you can do that that maybe the course help you with and maybe some courses don't, but certainly you could do it on your own back. Yeah, excellent. And Emma, there's a question here about, you know, roles that blend a business background and an IT background. I'm just going to come to you with that one because, you know, I said first years have expanded a little bit. So, you know, are there any roles out there that blend the kind of two things together, the business and the IT? Yes, absolutely. Um, certainly in first derivatives and um, I'm sure in many other companies um, at the moment as well. Um, roles like business analysts um, are something that we would take on. And that incorporates that little bit of tech and um, with, with not too much. But we've actually just recently introduced um, another stream onto our graduate program called um, the Financial Engineering Data Stream. Um, and that's looking for, you know, people with that background in business, that interest in finance, and also that interest in, in data. And there's a lot of Python training and things involved in it. So there's certainly um, opportunities out there for people coming from, you know, business management and finance backgrounds who want to, to delve into the tech industry. Um, with any fintech company, really. Yeah, that's excellent. And just quickly, if you don't mind sticking with you, Amber, there's someone here who's saying they have a marketing background, but they want to get the foot in the door of the technology sector. So what advice would you have for someone like that? Yeah, I would just say, um, you know your stuff, um, really going in um, to an interview and you want to show, um, especially on your cover letter as well, you know, getting across that passion um, that you have for technology and your willingness to learn and how you can um, translate your skills so you know your ability to look at a business and understand what they do and what their selling points are that's something that's really transferable and um, to the technology industry you can show you know I can develop this you know this huge knowledge and understanding of a business um, from a, a technical point of view and um, so just getting that across really but I think it's really important to do your research and show that you've actually made the effort to learn and um, some technical things you know obviously you might not be the the whiz kid that some other people might be and um, but definitely you know reading reading you know articles and knowing what's going on in the industry and things and showing that and um, that interest is so important for getting your foot in the door I think. Yeah, uh, you know, really, really good answer there, Mark. Again, can't really add anything to myself. So we did have a lot, loads more questions, but unfortunately, we are out of time. So apologies for that. But thank you so much, Emily, for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, some great insights and your experience is fantastic as well. So I hope everyone watching enjoyed that as well. Uh, do remember to refresh your screen if you want to, you know, keep up to date and watch the next uh, next seminar as well. But thank you, everyone, and enjoy the fair. Cheers. Thanks, Bob. See you later. Bye.